to, I'm going to do things a little different order than I've done in previous semesters. Uh, we're going to stay on the notion of queries. And we're going to talk about uh, a situation that, that you would have in many web applications where certain parts of the site might be restricted to specific users. All right. So for example, if you think of our Little League site, you know, a person might be able to update their player information, but they certainly can't go in and update everyone's player information. Or if you think on Angel, you know, you can submit your own stuff, but you certainly can't submit stuff for other people in the class. All right. Let's take you. Um, so we're going to look at we're going to look at at doing that, and that involves some kind of a login. So let me describe what we're going to do to, in today's class. I'm not sure what tables I have created, but that's okay. We'll take care of it. And it should be easy to see how this relates to the next assignment that I put out there. I was a little, how can I say this, aggressive as far as a deadline for the next assignment. Let's shoot for it, and we'll see how it goes. All right, if it proves to be problematic, I can always push it back. <coughs> All right. Let's imagine we were doing the Little League, um, the, the Little League database. Let's say we have a table of player information. That is one square dollar table. <laughs> and let's say in that we have, you know, probably a player ID, a first name last name, um, email address maybe, street address, city, state, zip, phone number, typical kind of stuff that you'd have for um, a person. And you wouldn't necessarily want someone to be able to access your personal information, but you should be able to. And you probably should even be able to update it, all right? This will be a nice segue into our next week's discussion, probably next week's discussion, on updating stuff uh, in a database. But what we would probably want is we would probably want something like this where there's a login, a user ID, and password. And we might not be able to change those here or whatever. But we'll put these on the screen as well, user ID and password. And when you log in, what's it going to do? It's going to run out to the database, and it's going to check to see if that combination of user ID and password exists in the, in the database. So assuming these are the columns here in the player table, what would the select statement look like for this guy? To look to see if there's someone in the database that matches. Which one is there? It would be their login ID though. Would it be the user ID now. Oh, okay, so it would be select uh, user ID. Mm -hmm. Where? Oh, I guess user ID and password. Okay. Where um, user ID equals password or user name, user ID, or where, the, the, that box right there, whatever you're using that, yeah. Be a question mark to start, Yeah. and then later on we'll say it's going to come from the text box. And it has to be an and statement because mm -hmm. both have to be true. Okay. And password equals question mark. All right. You can do this a few different ways in a nutshell this is correct, all right? One thing that you could do is you could select a count and just see, are there any people that match this? Because at most there should only be one, right? Because the user ID should be unique. So you could do this a couple different ways, but that's a reasonable way. I'm going to add one thing to this. It might be a little vague from my description, but I'm also going to add the player ID to this. Why? Because the player ID was implied, and it is the primary key to this table. So um, I'm going to
to uh, select that as well. All right. So we click on this. We want to run this query, and then we want to see what the results are. Now, we could put a grid view here on the bottom. But really, have you ever seen a login that had a grid view that after you typed it in, it showed you a list? That doesn't really make sense. All right? It doesn't really make sense to do that. In a nutshell, what we want to do in this particular case is we want a SQL statement to execute, but we don't necessarily need a visual component here. We want the SQL statement to process and to, to check and to make sure everything's okay, all right, but we don't necessarily want a um, visual component associated with it. So we're going to do our SQL access similar to what we've done before, except we're going to manually write the code. We'll see all the pieces that we saw when we created um, the, the, um, the uh, uh, data sets and the grid view, the only difference is we're going to write it ourselves. We're going to write the code ourselves. All right? This is a nice skill to have. We've been doing a lot of stuff sort of automagically, right? Um, we're using the framework to do a lot of stuff, to write our queries and to do this and to populate that, and that's great. But it's also nice to sort of be able to go off-road. Right? If you have a particular thing that you want to do that doesn't necessarily fit nicely into the framework, it's always good to, to know yourself how to do it. Now, if we successfully log in, what do we want to do? Well, we're going to want to call, call this player information and show the player information and maybe eventually even allow people to edit their own player information. All right. If they don't enter a successful password, user ID and password combination, what do we want to do? Well, we want to keep them on this page. All right, so if it's not successful, they stay right here. And we could do something like keep track of how many attempts or whatever, but we're not worried about that right this minute. All right. Another consideration. Because keep in mind that people can bookmark URLs, all right? People may not necessarily be accessing the pages the way you think they're going to access them, right? This is the web. You can request any page from a web server. Your pages have to be smart enough to be able to handle the fact that, they, that people could be coming at them from anywhere. So in other words, you may think that, oh, well, in this case, user ID and password, um, you know, they're going to see this page first before they see this page, all right? Yes, under the typical scenario, that's true. However, you also run into the potential that someone could go and access this page um, or try to access this page without going through the login and password. And what do you do? Well, if they try to access this page and they are not logged on, we should bounce them back to the login page. All right? Makes sense. Now, there might be a bunch of things in this application that require the, the, the knowledge of who the user ID is or who the person is. For example, there might be, here is your team. Here are your teammates. Here is your schedule. Here is your coach's phone number. There could be a bunch of pages that depend on knowing, the site knowing, who is logged in at any point in time. Just like in Angel, there's a bunch of pages uh, within Angel that depend on knowing who is logged in, right? When you send email, it knows that it's you. So the email comes from you, and I don't have to guess who it's from. All right. When you submit an assignment, when you take a quiz, uh, any of those sort of activities, when you go and view your course listing page, it knows, the application knows that it's you because you've logged on. 
And it doesn't forget that from page to page to page. All right? What is that an example of maintaining? State. It's an example of maintaining state. In other words, remembering something that happened before. Now, we talked about within a page, the controls themselves maintain the state. Well, in this case, clearly that's not going to be enough, right? Because we're talking about going between different pages. We talked about last time of using the query string to sort of maintain state, of passing information from one page to another. And we could, we could do that here. Well, once we know who's logged on, we could call this page and pass the information via the query string. However, we want to do something a little more than that because there could be a bunch of pages. So we want to remember this, in essence, as long as someone is logged on. All right? In other words, we want to remember this for the browser session. And that will be, and what we'll end up doing is we'll end up recording this data in a session variable. All right? We'll talk about how to do this uh, in a minute. So let's review what we have so far before we talk a little bit more about sessions. Login page could have a user ID and text box, or, or a user ID and password. They click log on. A SQL query runs to see if there are people that exist in the database with that. If there is, it, the, the page is going to remember the player ID, all right? It's going to remember player ID um, in a session variable. It will then redirect to the player information page, all right? If not, it's going to just stay on this page, and it's not going to set the session variable. What's the query on this screen going to look like to pull up one player's information? Select star mm -hmm. where so user ID equal. So select uh, star from, from oh from I'm sorry player yep. <coughs> where uh, user ID equals question mark because are we transferring the user ID from page to page? That that's a that's a good point. We could be doing user ID. But I think we said we're going to do player ID. Oh, did you? Oh, well, player oh, yeah, ID is yeah, a yeah, primary key. Yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. That's what I, that's what I meant to say. I just because the player ID will be two, the user ID will be like billy one four three seven or something. Yeah. All right. So we're going to do something like this on here. Where's that question mark going to get populated from? Uh, the player table. Oh, um, from the data that keeps getting transferred. And what's, what do the we call session, that? The session variable. Be transferred from the session, session variable. So the session variable will be used to bring in the player ID. What if someone tries to access this player page without logging in? He's going to get denied. How will, what will be the mechanism by which it will be denied? Security. It'll go to the login page then. Okay, but how is that going to happen? How are we going to tell that they're not logged in? If, like, session variable equals null or something. Right. We're going to test the session variable. All right? On the page load event of this guy, we're going to look to see if that session variable has been filled in yet. That session variable being filled in indicates that they're logged on. That session variable being not filled in indicates that they're not logged on. And if it's filled in, we go and we continue and do the rest of this page. If it's not filled in, we bounce them back to the login page. Now, what do I even mean by a session? What is a browser session? What creates a browser session and what ends a browser session? Logging in and logging out. It's, not like it's, it's when you open up a browser window and when you close a browser window. All right, I heard close, opening and closing a browser window. I heard logging in and logging out. There can also be a timeout. can also be a timeout. All right. Let's think of, um, let, let's think, and you probably have all had experiences with this from one place or another, all right? Um, in Angel, for example, if you were to log in today and 
leave your machine up overnight and go and try to do something, all right, tomorrow, it's liable to tell you something that your session has expired. All right? If you think about it, a web server knows when you've accessed it. A web server doesn't really know what happens after that unless it only knows if you've made a request or have not made a request. So think this through. I go in and I log on to Angel here on this machine. All right? I don't log out. All right, we'll talk about logging out later. I don't log out. I simply shut my browser window down. Does my web server know that that has happened? No. No. Web server doesn't know that that has happened. You're disagreeing with no, that no, statement? No, no, you're right. I'm just saying is when you, if you were to reopen, okay. I guess when, if you reopen the browser, when, like Angel, for example, if I were to log in, close the browser, right. go back, open the browser again, and go back to Angel, it will remember me as being logged in. So mine won't. So maybe I it do does. So. That, that's another mechanism. We're talking purely session variables no, here. Okay. Oh, oh, That's okay. a different browser session. The bottom line is, though, when you close the browser window, the server doesn't, like, get notified, like, hey, this guy closed their browser window. All right? Or when you shut down your machine. Or whether when you go home for the day. All right? What does a web server know? It knows if you've been making requests or not making requests. So, therefore, typically with a session, there's going to be a timeout period where the server says, hey, if I don't hear from this person in 20 minutes, an hour, four hours, whatever, I'm going to assume they went home for the day or they're, they're done. Why would the server make that assumption? Why wouldn't the server just leave you logged on forever? In case somebody else were to come along. In case someone else come along and, and it would, wouldn't be very good if someone else, like if, for example, you left Angel open in lab and someone came up uh, after you. What's another reason that the server would want to log you out? Save resources. Save resources, right? Because the server has to keep track of this stuff, all right? And if it never logged you out, then every session ever created would still be alive and the server would have to try to remember something about that. And that's not good. All right. What's the disadvantage? Uh, so the server doesn't, the server has to pick a sweet spot as far as timing out. And that's going to depend entirely on the kind of activity you're doing, right? In Angel, what would be a reasonable timeout period of time? I, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, what would be reasonable, and why do you do you think that's reasonable? Why or why not? I think 15 minutes is yeah, because like if you haven't done anything, it, Angel's simplistic. I mean, it's really if you haven't done anything 15 minutes, I don't think, I don't think you're going to do anything. You're doing something else and just forgot about it at that point. In my opinion. That's usually how it works for me. Unless you're taking a quiz. Well, yeah, but then you're it's making movement. As long as you move well, it depends how the quiz is written. For example, I could have a one quiz question. That takes four hours. Explain. Let's not jump to any conclusions. Here. Right. Explain what happened in the Civil War. But you know, and, and it's like, okay, that's going to take you probably more than 15 minutes to write. But when you but, but it recognizes, oh, you mean you're going to write it somewhere else? And then no, 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 no. Up, and there's a, a box. If I am typing in a text box, am I communicating with the server? No, but the, the, I believe, though, it recognizes it as it being used. Though. You can send it when you start the quiz instead of instead of 15 minutes, make it six and a half hours. It, exactly. The point is, is unless you do, you're doing some funny business in the background, when you're typing into a text area, it has no idea you're not communicating with the server. You're inside the client. And therefore... There could be other ways to handle it potentially, but typically what Alan said is true. They'll change the default for that. They'll change the server timeout time to maybe two hours or I mean, I've two and a half hours. I've seen exams on, on Angel where they'll, and they give you a timer and say, all right, you have two hours right. to do this and you get it. Right. Or email. 
You could be composing a long email. That, that always used to burn me. I would compose a long email and go and hit send and it logged me out because it didn't recognize I was doing anything and therefore it, it clobbered my session. I feel like though when it comes to like email or if you're going like on your bank mm -hmm. to check out your account, the timer's probably shorter though because that's sensitive material. Or else Absolutely. Like angels, there's not that much damage that can be done. So I feel like the timer oh, oh, there. Oh, oh. <laughs> Let me get on your well, angel for just five Let minutes. me get on your angel for two minutes, and I'll show you all the damage that can be done. Well, nobody thinks like you. Your and professor Jesse. is gonna. Think no, this. everybody thinks like me and Jesse and all that. Uh, the, <laughs> moving on. The, the point. <laughs> give me your angel for thirty the seconds. The point. The point is stuff. well taken. The point is well taken. If, for example, you've, done, you've logged on to ESPN.com and reviewing your favorite sports team's results for the past week, then that's probably of a different sort than if you're logging into your bank account. So in that case, yeah, the session timeout period is probably much quicker for some sensitive information. So it's a combination of how it's going to be used, right? Too long of a session timeout, and one, there's security issues as far <coughs> as the client goes, and two, there is resource issues as far as the server goes. The server has to remember all this stuff when Gee, they probably went home if they haven't looked at a score in ESPN.com for the past six hours. My, right. camp, my campus actually alerts you if you go into the My yeah. Campus. You get a little pop-up saying that, you know, we're going to... Yeah, I, I, I've, seen other, I've seen other sites that do that. I'm trying to remember my which math one. My lab does that. Yeah, uh, it, it might even be my bank that does that. Do you need more time? Are you here? It's either that or the IRS. Sometimes it's like reactivate. Pardon me? Sometimes it'll be like you want to reactivate this page. Yeah. Like, yeah. like bankers have something different. Yeah, that what what that likely does is that likely again, there's probably a mix and match of several techniques here. We're just looking at the techniques individually in the most simplistic cases. It could be that, for example, there's hidden form fields that remember some session information and it could log you back on when, when you when you click reactivate. All right, so too long is bad, too short is an inconvenience for the user. You know, if, if you had to, you know, if the, the, the logout uh, session timeout period was a minute, then if you read the syllabus for a minute and then went to another page, you have to log on again, and, and that would be terribly inconvenient. Now, you can't explicitly log out, all right? Like in Angel, there's a logout button, and in most applications, web applications, there's a logout button. And that's <coughs> nice from the server because the server then can clobber your session resources right then and there. All right? And it's good for you, too, because then you don't have the risk of security. Now, we won't talk about these today. We probably will hit them later on. I'm not sure. But cookies are a way to remember stuff between sessions. All right? So that... Like a lot of times it will say something like, are you on a private computer or are you on a public computer? Then if you're on a private computer, it remembers in a little file your login credentials so it can log you on automatically. All right, with that in mind, let's go and do this. Uh, I'm going to start with a brand new uh, web application here, um, just for the heck of it. <coughs> and I'm going to create my player table. And... We'll go and we'll try to do this. We'll probably be able to get to all this today. If not, we'll see how far we do get. another database and in the interest of time I might not put all the fields on it but I'll put some of the fields on it
So I'll call this a player table. I'm going to be sure after I add a few things to go back and delete them so that there's big gaps in the numbers. This is a version therapy. I know you folks are afraid of this, so I'm going to do it over and over again until you lose your, your fear. You'll thank me later. We'll start out now just doing simple, and then we'll have our user ID. Are we going to get into doing forms and stuff for databases? Are we going to create any type of like a, like, because we're going to create a login here, but what if somebody wanted to create a login from our page? Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that. Okay. One thing at a time, right? Yep. <clears throat> All right, so that's what we have for the player table. All right, I'm going to go and... Save it. And I'm going to go create my new web application. New website. Empty website. I'll put it on the desktop. So it's good that our data goes in there. I'm going to go over here and hit refresh. All right. Now I should be good to go. So I'm going to go and I'm first going to create my login form. All right. So I'll go in. Now there's login stuff within ASP.NET Framework. But I think it's good to know how to do some of the stuff by scratch, right? So we're going to write our own little login form. So I'm going to go new file, and I'll call the page default.aspx, and I'm going to put create my form elements. Do keep in mind that my expectation is that you create completed looking web pages um, in class, just in the interest of time. I don't necessarily spend a lot of time styling them, but um, that doesn't mean that you don't have to. What I'm going to do to start out is I'm going to put a text box. Actually, I'll put a label. And then I'll get rid of that label. I'll put in another label in a text box. We'll copy and paste. The label I am not so concerned about making sure the idea is proper because I'm never going to program this. I could program this. What would be a case where I want to program this label? In other words, this label is going to say user ID. When would I ever want to access and change this label? Maybe if you wanted to show their name on it or something. The actual name. The name. You wanted to give them a hint. How about if you wanted, to, if uh, you went to the sign up for a user ID, or so, so user ID say. I'm not, I'm not 
sure my, I don't think you ever would want to. my question is clear. I can think of a couple cases of where I'd want to program this. One is, um, maybe if I'm doing some kind of validation, I, I might want to some server-side validation on this. I might want to change the way the label looks. If, like, for example, they entered in a stolen credit card number. I know there's no credit card here, but thinking in a bigger sense. The other thing is if I was internationalizing or, or localizing my application. So you change the language. Why do I want to change the language? Or I, another language. You know, the rest of the form would stay the same, but I could go through programmatically, pull up a list of label text fields, depending on the language, and then just go and programmatically switch that. It would be something I could create a nice little class for, all right, and maybe a database table that says on this page, this label, in this language, should say this. And so I could. But as a general rule for what we're doing here, or we're probably never going to do that. All right, uh, this on the other hand, we definitely want to program something with it. So I will go in and change the name of it. And I'll put a button here. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to put a label for the results. Ultimately, we're going to redirect if they've successfully logged in. But until we get that going, I'm just going to put the result saying that they've logged in successfully, they've not logged in successfully. Yes? So what's the difference in doing it this way and just uh, bringing over the ASP portion of it? Because over there you can't just do a login and it'll create the label, both labels and the button for you. You like using this? Yeah. What's um. The, what's the? Is there is there a difference or? The the difference is, you know. You know this this is this is a difference between going and. <laughs> Buying a pack of Lucky Strikes or, or rolling your own, right? We're rolling our own Just here. Just subtle differences. Well, well, I can make sure I only have the stuff that I absolutely need in there. Okay. Whereas if I uh, if I use their login, it's all or nothing. yeah, I mean, it, it, there may be extra weight, extra overhead that they put in there and connect things. Whereas, you know. Additionally, I want to show you how to do something specifically. I want to show you how to write code programmatically that creates a data source and so on. And so this is a good example as any. Okay. So, yeah. I didn't know if there's like, that doesn't come with any like security features to it or anything like well, that. Well, there's a lot of stuff built into it. Yeah. Um, feel free to investigate and, and play around with that yeah. um, on your own. All right. I'm going to skip validation. All right, just out of laziness, but it would be a good idea to validate. The one thing I am going to do is under... There really wouldn't even, you really wouldn't need validation for this because it could be a combination of characters and numbers and special characters, right? Is there such a thing as a user without a user ID? A password without a password? Oh, valid right. point. Uh, additionally, there might be some rules as far as it has to be at least certain characters long. And in that way, again, the, the, the benefit of that is you are accessing it and you're doing your test before it goes to the server to, to do that. So you can get some quicker feedback. I'll stay quiet, thank you. No, that's okay. Text mode, I'm going to pick password. All right. And what that will do is that will mask the characters as I type them in. All right. So I go and run this. And of course, we're going to have our GUI correct. But I do want to test that out first, make sure it looks the way that I would expect it to before I actually write the code for that. 
So I type in my user ID and password, log in, doesn't do anything. Notice that the password control does not maintain state. That's sort of a security feature where the user ID, which is a plain text box, does. Now I'm going to go in and add uh, a user into my database so that we can test this out. to do in the database is I probably should make the user ID not allow duplicates, right? Because user ID is what's called a candidate key. It could be our primary key, all right? And, um, well, yeah, I should also make it required, as I should with password. Um, and it needs to be unique. In other words, there can't be two MLZs. Password, I am not going to make, or I will make that required, but there's really no index on it. Two people potentially could have the same password. All right. Password is quite common. Indeed it is. All right. So we're now all set, and we can... We can go in and we can continue with this process that we write the code behind. Now the code behind is going to be on the button press, button click event of this. I do want to look at the code. Sometimes I obsess about this, I know, but I think it's important. Notice what it did is it added on click, button login click. That's what really associates this event with this control. And because this is running on the server, on click means on click when it has made it back to the server. All right. I'm now going to go, and this is code that I don't write real often, so I'm going to refer to my notes. And in a nutshell, what we're going to do is we're going to do about the same thing as we would do um, if we were creating um, if we were creating this um, using the GUI, except we're going to do it programmatically. All right. One thing I am going to do is. I'm going to create my second page, all right, before I log in. That way I can redirect to it. So I'll go to New File, Web Form, and I'll call it Player Info. I'm going to pick SQL Data Source. I'm not going to pick a grid view. All right. Why do you think I'm not going to pick a grid view? Well, because I want to show something else. All right. Why do I want to show something else? Well. Keep in mind, this player view is going to view just one single player. All right? In other words, when I log on, I want to see my player information. I'm not going to see a list of players' information. So I'm only going to see one. A grid view is typically set up when you have a list of items. So I'm going to use what's called a details view. All right, I'm going to go and configure the data source. Okay, 
create a new connection. Save it as connection string. And in the interest of time, I'm going to say, I'll go and do a custom code, but I'll just say select star from player where player ID equals what? Question mark. Something that's going to get filled in at runtime. Next. Where is that going to come from? Where is that parameter going to come from? Well, it's not going to come from a form control. It's not going to come from the query string. It's going to come from the session variable. So I'll pick session variable. The specific session variable, the specific session field, I'm going to say is player ID. Now, keep in mind, this is almost like what we did with the query string, right? It doesn't, I didn't have to choose the same name as the field in the database, but I did just because that seems a reasonable thing to do, right? It only has to match up with where I put that data. Just like in the query string, right? When I created my link, I created my query string to say ID, and then the second page was looking for the data in the query string field called ID. Same thing here. It doesn't really matter what I call it. It just has to match up. When I create the session variable, it has to match up with what this page is expecting. Next, I can test the query. I can give it the value. And there it goes. Shows me the, the, the set. I can hit finish. Then I can bind that to my data source. All right. And we won't do much cosmetically with that. I trust you can all do that um, from the stuff that we did before. Okay. Now we have to make the login code work and either redirect to this page or stay on the default page. So, I'm going to create, oh this is great, I have this, I have this written in Visual Basic code. So, <laughs> oh, that's fun. Yeah. Nothing like a little translation to get the day going. I wonder if, uh, wonder if Google Translate does this. doing here? Let me, let me expand this so that we can see the code. You're uh, that's, uh, creating a, um, uh, instantiating, but I can't remember what it's called. You're creating uh, an object. An object yeah, I'm creating a data source object. Now, how have I done, I've done this before, right? How have I done it? I've done it before using the GUI. I haven't not created it programmatically before. All right, but effectively it's doing the same thing. Now, when I create a data source, what do I have to specify? I have to specify a couple different things, right? Think of all the things when we created that data source a minute ago. I had to specify the connection string, all right? Uh, uh, information about how to connect to the database. I had to specify the select statement that I want to run, all right? If you remember, I typed in select star from question mark. I then have to specify <coughs> the parameters and where the SQL statement is going to get its parameters filled in from. So I'm going to do that same thing here, except instead of doing it via the GUI, I'm going to do it via my code. So I'm going to say OBJ. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to say DS dot Provider name equals Do you have to go to the config file? 
Yes, I do. And my example being a little out of date, let's do a quick Google. You know, I'm surprised putting some of these things you search for up here doesn't bring up more porn sites. You know, the internet is like 90% pornography. But very few accessing uh, a involves accessing a ASP.net config file. <laughs> access, I, I would imagine. It just sounds like dirty porn to me. That's all. Yeah. Uh, oh, is she accessing that file? Oh. All right, Jesse, somebody had two sites. Like, In addition, it is very likely that safe search is turned on here. That's true. You don't let your kids play with the computer and access it. Right now, I'm going to Google it and see if it's up. And just Google accessing is going to be like accessing the banks. Jesse. I need to have a using statement up here. That's why I didn't find my configuration manager. Closed in quotes, I have to put the name of the connection string, which I believe I simply call connection string. We'll find that out. going to set the connection string itself. The provider is the kind of database it is. The connection string is the specifics to connect to this connection string. this will do it. Using the web configuration manager to connect and accessing the connection strings provider and connection string. I then need to set my select command. And what did we say it was? It was something like select, oops, select, you can actually simplify this, player ID from player where user ID equals question mark. 
and password. Or what I say, user password? Yes, no, you just password. Equals question mark. Let me look at the table and see for sure. User password. Oh, man. All right. So I've defined a select statement. We've done that before again, except we use the GUI. Here we're doing it pro programmatically. Now, way back a couple lectures ago, the question was asked something along the lines of, what if I wanted to make it where I could search for one by one of a criteria or the other criteria or both criteria? In that case, your SQL statement would actually be different. In one case, you'd have a one-part where clause. In the other case, you'd have a different one-part where clause. And in the third case, you'd have a two-part where clause. Well, you'd use some technique like this to actually programmatically change the select statement to have the proper where clause. All right? So stuff like this, of taking control of the code and doing it exactly the way that you want to is a way, is one way when you want to do something different than what the framework allows or easily allows anyhow. All right. So you can always go in and write the code yourself if you don't like the way the framework does something. It's sort of the message here. Now, I have to specify the parameters for this. I have to say where those two question marks are going to get filled in from. the user ID getting filled from? Label user ID. Well, not the label, but text, text box. Finally, where's the password? The dot rookie mistake here. Text. text. All right, there we go. Capital T. All right. Do the same thing for password. specify the connection parameters. Well, we did that. We specify the SQL statement. Well, we did that. We specify where the parameters get filled in. We did that. Now what we have to do is we have to actually go and read this. Okay? We have to go and execute the select statement. Now, keep in mind, the way that our select statement in this case is written is only going to return at most one row. Right? In other words, there isn't going to be two people that have the same user ID and password. At most, this is going to return one row. But that's what we want, right? One person, one user. Well, yeah, that's why we wrote it that way, right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> My point is, though, is that select statements in general, however, can return more than one row. So that's why some of the code we're going to look at might seem a little goofy in this case because we know we only have one row. However, in a larger sense, we, our select statements 
could potentially return more than one row. So we're going to create a going on here saying I can't create because that's an abstract class let's oh it's an interface
like 70% of the Google searches out of there. Google search is out of there. Oh, oh, but good job. I'll tell you what, in the interest of time, I will wrap this up and post it. I do apologize. I did not realize my example that I have code for was out of date. I'll finish this up and I'll post the results um, probably you know, later today. All right. So let's go to lab. All right. <laughs> You know, you're gonna get you're gonna get comments on your YouTube videos like, why don't you say the same thing every time anymore? I, like I, have, years from now. I have gotten comments 
saying that I say all right a lot. All right? As soon as I graduate, I'll start writing obscene comments on his videos. Well. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I thought you were going to get it there for a minute. <laughs> yeah, it's. It's one of those things that when something goes wrong and you're talking like this, it like shakes you and you stop thinking clearly. Yeah, I know. And uh, we're all and, watching you. <laughs> and, and you're right, right, right. And I am sure that there is just some tiny thing that I got wrong, and it, it'll probably take me two minutes to fix. But some kind of syntax thing. Two minutes. Not... Two minutes uh, in front of the. In front of the camera is a long time. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. Yeah, I was able to figure that out with the um, with the SQL commands. Okay, it was the way I was joining the tables. Okay, that messed it up. Okay, excellent. Also, um, would you mind writing a recommendation for me? I just, uh, yeah, I, I just saw your email. Um, yeah, I can do that. Okay, all right. Um, do I send it to you, or do I send it directly? Well, I'll submit the um, I'll submit the um, application with your email, and they'll send you the link to the recommendation. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thank you. No problem.